Welcome to Colony TV, the governmental educational channel for the town of Colony. Well, welcome to Getting to Know You. My name is Joe Nash. Today we're going to be talking to Ray Misowitz. He's been to our library many times. He does presentations, various presentations, on America's nuclear submarine, um, nuclear submarine force. And he's going to be here on February 28th. It's a Thursday night at 7 o'clock with his new um, presentation. So welcome, Ray. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for being here. You, you know our library well. Um, before we start talking about what you do and all the different presentations on the nuclear sub force. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself, the, the capsule biography. I know you worked at Atomic. Nova yeah, I, I've, uh, I was a, uh, a mechanical and nuclear engineer at the, uh, at the Knowles Atomic Power Laboratory for, uh, if you consider both full time and, 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 and uh, uh, contract work after I retired, uh, about 43 okay. years there, mainly designing the uh, the nuclear propulsion plants uh, for uh, the submarines and aircraft carriers, and uh, I, I actually managed the reactor design, the nuclear okay. reactor design group at the uh, at the at the lab. And they mainly did submarines and aircraft carriers. Only that's our okay. job. I, the uh, the it's a unique place in, in that it's a, it's a government owned uh, corporate operated facility. The government owns the facility, and then they use a corporation like. GE, which yeah. is where I started, uh, to come in and run the place uh, yeah. for them and provide okay. me uh, for that uh, for that job. So we've been through General Electric and uh, and uh, Martin Marietta and Lockheed Martin, and now the latest uh, contractor to run the uh, facility is Bechtel. Okay, Bechtel Engineering. Now, were you? Were you in the service? Before? I was never in the service. Oh, okay. I went right from college to uh, to that job. It's the only job I've ever had. Okay. <laughs> I worked for one place for uh, on and off for 43 years, and that. Uh, uh, is the only place now. I've been associated with the folks in the Navy. On the other hand, the right. Navy is was is our customer uh, there, and uh, and so I, I know both the uh, the civilian and the naval side of the of, the, okay. of that business. Yeah. So you, you actually, when you say you design the nuclear propul, these are like the things that what that. The ships uh, well, run on. I, I'm not really, yeah, I'm I mean, I, we actually designed the uh, the, uh, the 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 thing that provides the go juice, the nuclear reactor. I, we we did the physics, the thermal yeah. hydraulics, the reactor safety work. We do all the mechanical drawings and then get it built. Okay. So I think yeah. people forget that on these ships, nuclear powered ships, there is kind of like a little. There's a nuclear reactor. Right absolutely, there, right? absolutely. Little, is it a mini one or is it a real? Iron? Well, I mean, uh, <laughs> these things, uh, that, that, those, uh, in the, in the latest classes of ships, the Seawolf and, and, uh, and uh, Virginia uh, class attack submarines, those nuclear reactors will power that ship for the life of the boat for 35 okay. years. They will never be serviced and never touched. Really? So that's okay. quite an engineering accomplishment yeah. if you yeah. think of what I, about what I just uh, said there. Yeah. So, uh, so now your hobby, and I'll tell people watching, Ray does these PowerPoint presentations, wonderful pictures, and a, a narration, and he um, does all the research himself. And he has 10 different um, programs he does. He's been to our library many times, and he'll be here with a new one, which we'll talk about at the end. But how did you, how did you start this hobby of doing these presentations? You've been doing this for 10 years, you were telling me. Right, and so while I was working, you know, one of the things I realized uh, being able to see the uh, the way the Navy worked and the civilian side yeah. of the of the not only the design but the operations of the of the boats, there's so many stories and people uh, that most folks would have never heard about. Yeah. And I decided that as a as a hobby in retirement that I try to publicize some of those things. You know, they do call it the silent service. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you really don't uh, get much of that out of the, uh, out of the, out of the folks who are uh, 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 the crew retirees. Yeah. So uh, I took on a, a little hobby uh, to keep my computer skills up and to, uh, and to talk uh, about these things uh, to, the, to the public. And I've been doing that uh, on and off for about 10 years. In fact, I think I, I count it up. I've done 125 okay. uh, uh, lectures over the now, course of 
course of that period. In the course of your designing the propulsion, were you, did you actually ever go on? Some yes. of the submarines and aircraft carriers yes. were like, Both. not just why they are um, installing them, but did you actually go oh, on no, cruises? Yeah, no, I've been at sea uh, for, uh, I think, the minimum uh, time, around an average of a, of a week, several oh, okay. trips on the uh, on uh, on submarines and uh, and on the uh, actually it was on the Dwight D Eisenhower uh, aircraft carrier. Oh, okay. the aircraft, yeah. Both so w times. when you're doing that, are you just observing? Are you trying to make sure everything? Well, works it depends. Right uh, <laughs> you know, sometimes it's a uh, in, sometimes it's a support for a sea trial oh, yeah. uh, uh, coming out of an overhaul or something. That was the Dwight Eisenhower one. Okay. Sometimes it's a learning experience for me. Uh, if I'm working on a new design, for example, and the uh, and the customer has some some things they want me to understand in terms of the operation of the existing fleet before we go off and design something new, they'll send you out and, and okay. so you can observe. Uh, 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 things happening, okay? Okay. including combat conditions, uh, not 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 real ones, but, yeah, but yeah. staged. You know, so, like yeah. a, now. Yeah. What do you do? You have a preference? I mean, submarine or a aircraft carrier is one more? Or are they told they so totally different? Well, I guess uh, <laughs> yeah, I actually do, and it probably wouldn't be the one that you thought. But I I, I do have a preference for the submarines. Oh, yeah. The aircraft carrier, you know, has fifty five hundred people on oh, yeah. it. It's like it's like riding a, one of those big cruise ships, and uh, <laughs> and you're out there. You can never yeah. you can never hide on an yeah. aircraft carrier, yeah. and uh, and uh, the submarine is a much smaller crew. Uh, the 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 crew and the officers on board are are, are a, a much tighter knit because there's only a hundred and yeah. some of okay. them on board, not fifty five hundred. So it's a much different environment, and okay. I prefer that 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 smaller environment. So a typical sub. nuclear sub has around a hundred or so. Yeah, between a hundred and one hundred twenty okay. uh, people on board. Now your presentations, you um, do, you've done a lot of research. Like I was telling people, there's a PowerPoint. You do have a lot of pictures. How do you? Uh, why don't you tell us how you do? How do you do your research, and how how do you come up with some of the topics? Topics. Like, well, uh, like for example, your life aboard a nuclear submarine. Well, I mean, start, uh, when I started with. the life, uh, that was the first one I did because I thought that would uh, it would be the easiest for me since I've at least been on them. And, yeah. and, uh, and uh, uh, Actually, uh, there is an interesting book that Tom Clancy, of all people, put together. The author who, uh, who oh, yeah, took the, his own yeah. trip on the on a uh, on a nuclear submarine, and uh, and uh, you know he's a much better writer than I am in terms <laughs> of uh, of uh, what was done. And uh, so that kind of I used that book, and then uh, believe it or not, you can find almost anything you need on the internet. So you, you, a even lot from of, nuclear submarines, okay. yes. And, so know, a lot of your pictures, you just uh, most of the pictures are coming off of the uh, of the. Uh, Internet. There's a very good uh, uh, website. It's called uh, 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 NavSource. It's a uh, private uh, website, but the Navy sponsors it, and uh, they have uh, pictures, photos, and uh, and uh, of all of the op all of the submarines that have ever existed, okay. and uh, and stories about them on it okay. uh, that are very that's very helpful. I get a lot of pictures off of that uh, site, but. Uh, the most interesting pictures that really come out of the uh, a, a search on the internet are the ones that uh, individual crewmen have posted. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's, uh, that that's uh, very helpful. Here. Do you have to get permission, or you just copy? Uh, them? Yeah. No. I, I mean, I, I I look at those as public. Okay. And it, I mean, I have to be very careful in terms of what I can talk about. I, and so, if it's in the public domain, I can do okay. that. If it's something I know because of the work that I did, that's not in the public domain. I obviously, I cannot okay. talk on that. Now, does that mean? You you know something is classified or yeah okay so now on your um, oh the other thing is when you research sometimes you show like headlines from the paper that's you just got all those online too sure okay. yes absolutely okay. yep so we'll, we'll talk about some of your a little bit we'll talk for a minute or two about each one of these and people get an idea and then at the end we'll tell them where they where they can see you in the upcoming months okay and if they're interested in any of these that's fine so life aboard a nuclear submarine is. Is that just sort of self-explanatory, or it really it really is because uh, I, that's I, the one you're telling me kids like that one. Too. I used a, I used a composite of uh, of uh, of a couple of uh, opportunities on subs to uh, to uh, put that together, uh, and uh, what that's what that really does is show you uh, how you live and work yeah. uh, on a uh, on a on a nuclear submarine, what the training was like to get to the point of being able to do that, and then uh, what uh, what's your schedule? How do yeah. you do it? How do you physically uh, uh, live on 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 board? Okay. And uh, and uh, for example, uh, the uh, 
the uh, most of the boats run on an 18-hour day. They don't run on a 24-hour oh, okay. day. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, and uh, and they do that because there's a certain number of shifts uh, that you yeah. can you can put on 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 watch. Um, and so uh, that that particular trip took me out to a uh, uh, a set of war games uh, in the uh, in the North Atlantic, which I was there to observe and. Uh, and watching how the the crew uh, reacts to the situations that arise, and, and how they eat and sleep, and how I ate and slept, okay. and so, so on. So you just bring. Okay. So it's a it's a, it's a good it's a good okay. initial thing to do yeah. before you get into any of the okay. other stories. Well, I mean, I must say I've seen many of your programs here. You know, all of these are sort of self-contained. They all have. Oh, absolutely. You don't have to, you don't have to see them in a certain. You don't have to see them in an order, but it is it, yeah. the first. I usually offer that one up the first time I go to okay. a new venue. Oh, okay. Uh, anyway, as a as a. Well, point. the next one of your talks here. It's a very sort of a famous um, submarine. It's the circumnavigation of the globe by the USS Triton. I was like in the early '60s. What what can you what can you say about that one? Well, the that interesting thing? the interesting thing about that is I happen to know. Uh, a uh, who unfortunately who has passed, but uh, I happen to know a original crew member on the Triton that was on that voyage. Oh, okay. He uh, he used to live in El Nora, and uh, and uh, he had a lot of memorabilia from that oh, okay. from that trip, and so we kind of conspired to uh, to put that uh, that uh, that talk together. It was pretty easy because uh, there is a lot of information on that okay. uh, on that, including a beautiful article in the early National Geographic uh, oh, okay, uh, yeah. books on uh, on. Uh, pictures of the actual uh, voyage itself. Uh, his name was Charlie Cleveland, uh, by the way. He's uh, unfortunately had an accidental death, and uh, he was, a, uh, he was a, uh, a crew member on board the Triton from the day it, uh, they laid the first part of the keel uh, mm -hmm. until he uh, left the service. And he was on board this trip. Okay. So I had a firsthand knowledge yeah. of the... Uh, well, it's, of the it's interesting you mentioned his name because I was going to tell people I've seen probably six or seven of your presentations, and one thing you do, I don't know if it's on purpose or just part of the research, but whatever you're talking about, you mentioned the crew member's name. I always find that very interesting, like you were saying, well, this is the, Mm. The communications room and the guy's name was. You, you constantly yeah. are mentioning names. Well, I wonder if that. My, my, but I do that purposely because okay. the whole uh, the whole objective here is to rec to put names and, and and faces of people in the front yeah. of the of the public and say, look, these are real people mm -hmm. that that do these kinds of things, or they're out there every day sure. doing them. You know, either in the design world or in the uh, operation of the boats themselves, and and that's really what my my whole. Game plan yeah. here is no, in, this, uh, in this is to put real names and real faces. I know in a lot of your presentations you have pictures with their names. Sure. Of, yeah. And actually, even this is a little bit ahead of ourselves, but you did a program here on um, the Soviet sub, and you, you mentioned all those guys' names too. That, um, yes. Yeah. You know, well, we'll get to that one. <laughs> so now the next talk that you do um, again for people watching, if you if you, if you see race going to be somewhere, you never know which talk he'll be doing, but. You have a program on. Oh wait, one other thing about the um, Triton. Triton. Did they did they stay underwater for the whole circumnavigation, or they did they serve? Yeah, they circumnavigated the globe underwater. They did have to come to the uh, to the uh, to the surface. Uh, ju actually, just as they left, uh, they had an uh, they had a uh, a, a uh, crewman that suffered a, a appendicitis oh, okay. attack, okay. and so they came up long enough to get the guy okay. off, and then they they backtracked and, and went the rest of the way. Now, how, how long could a nuclear submarine? Stay underwater without coming up. Is that uh, a nuclear submarine can stay underwater indefinitely. You really? make your own air uh, uh, to uh, you make your own oxygen uh, to really? uh, to okay. breathe, and you and you distill your own water. Uh, and the only limitation about uh, about mission time is how much food yeah, and okay. other consumables that you uh, that you can put on board and store. So they literally could stay underwater for six months if they. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, I mean, the uh, the ballistic missile boats do. I mean, they oh, okay. stay under oh, ninety didn't. days right. or so. Yeah. So your next talk here, um, you have one. You have one about submarines and the North Pole. What what can you what do what do you want to say about that one? Well, uh, the uh, you know. The, the first ship of any kind to reach the North Pole was the USS Nautilus, which was a submarine. And of mm -hmm. course, they did it under the, yeah. you know, the, in, the, at the, in the Arctic, uh, the, uh, there, there is no land mass underneath yeah. the ice. It floats on the, uh, okay. on the Arctic Ocean. So uh, the voyages of the, uh, of the Nautilus and, and the skate, which followed year to year, uh, really opened up that arena uh, for, the, uh, for the U.S. Navy, the, uh, the uh, 
uh, Nautilus was the first to uh, circum, uh, go from the uh, Pacific to the At Atlantic under the North Pole, submerged. And the following uh, year, uh, the skate went to the North Pole and was the first to surface mm -hmm. uh, through the ice at the, uh, at, the okay. at the North Pole. And there's one other story in that, uh, and I threw it in there because I found it and it was so alluring that I had to publicize it to people. But back in 1931, Sir Hubert Wilkins, uh, who was then um, uh, a, uh, he was actually an Australian, uh, but uh, uh, tried to take an old pre-World War I submarine under the ice pack. His goal was to reach the, mm -hmm. the and that's a very interesting story oh, okay. to see. If he failed, obviously, yeah. but uh, but uh, that's the that's the third uh, story. And okay. actually, I lead off with that one in that uh, in that in that talk. All right. Well, I'll tell tell people watching for a lot of your talks that we're talking about here, um, presentations. I mean, you do give a lot of history leading up to whatever, so it's always good. I think you had pictures of um, yes. of that in there. Yep. So that your next two are sort of related, but two two different situations. You have two different presentations on submarines that were lost, USS Thresher and the USS Scorpion, um, sort of famous, um, unfortunate situations, but, and then you go through, tell us about these two, um, and this, these were act, obviously Cold War era. Cold War era, uh, the, uh, there, there, there have been only two uh, uh, United States nuclear submarines that have been lost at sea, and unfortunately both of those uh, uh, submarines were lost with all hands uh, mm -hmm. on, on board. Uh, the Thresher was lost in, in, in uh, 1963 in about 8,400 feet of water, about 200 miles uh, east of, uh, of Cape Cod. Uh, and uh, uh, five years later, almost to the, uh, almost to the month, uh, the USS Scorpion uh, was lost in about 11,000 feet of water um, about 400 miles uh, southwest of the Azores in the uh, in the uh, in the west in the eastern uh, Atlantic uh, Ocean, and so, in both of those uh, those talks, what I try to do is uh, say you know follow that boat from uh, its uh, its 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 beginnings at the shipyard, mm -hmm. and and what it what they went through up to the time yeah. that the casualty occurred that uh, that that caused the uh, the problem. And I think you also because I saw I've seen both of these presentations you. You do go into the rescue attempts. And yeah, uh, we have, uh, that's right. And, and so after that, how did we find the ship and uh, boat and, uh, and uh, what was done? Uh, uh, really, at those depths, there really yeah. is no yeah. attempt at rescue. But uh, the, uh, to, to at least find the wreckage and, and try to discern from the wreckage what the, the, the problems were. And we have pictures in both of those presentations of the, uh, of the undersea wreckage of, yeah. those, uh, of those ships okay. and how it was interpreted by the people. Uh, it is interesting, Joe. You know, when you talk about having people locally, uh, the uh, I was doing the Thresher talk, uh, and I had I have the pictures that were taken from the Robert Conrad. It's a it's a research vessel that uh, it's operated by the Lamont Observatory uh, out of Columbia University. And after the talk, I had these pictures and um, and uh, that the uh, that the remote operating vehicle took of the ocean yeah. floor. The fellow who took the pictures was in was the that? audience, and he had the actual masters of the really? uh, of those photographs okay. that I was uh, that was showing that's I, who would have thought what's the possibility well of that I, this happening? is a time you've told me many times because you've been to, you've been to our library so much almost every single time you do a talk somewhere inevitably because yeah. usually I 40 50 people show up Inevitably, someone, no matter what talk you're doing, somehow there's a connection. Yeah. I don't know. What the, are some uh, of those? I don't know, but uh, for <laughs> example, the Scorpion uh, talk, uh, when I did that at the Military Museum in Saratoga Springs, uh, the sister of the, uh, of the chief of the boat that was lost on that boat was there, and they were actually, her and her husband were actually traveling down to, uh, to uh, uh, Newport News for the 40th yeah. anniversary of the loss of the ship. Wow. And interestingly enough, I'm going to do that same talk up at the uh, Moroccan. Community Center in uh, in uh, South Glens Falls, and uh, when I talked to the director there, she said uh, one of the women are extremely interested because she's the widow right. of one of the crewmen on wow. the uh, on the that's, Scorpion. I know so. that you were telling me. Yeah. That's, that's right. Oh, then one other quick thing about the Scorpion, you do mention because again, there's a fascinating one that I I came to here at the library was. Um, there's some, uh, you discussed several theories of the, why it possibly sunk because they're, they're not really, was it 
supposedly on a secret mission, or did they not know, or what? Well, just, I remember that one was they uh, just pro they were on their uh, the, 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 that boat was lost on on its transit back from a patrol that had been they had gone about six months. Uh, they came out of the Mediterranean to come across the uh, Atlantic, and they were they were sidestepped uh, on their way to go on a, on a uh, on a secret uh, mission to observe some uh, uh, Soviet uh, naval uh, yeah. trials that were going on. When they finished that, they uh, they uh, they did come to the surface as they transited away. Made one uh, radio transmission that was quite long, and uh, then they went back into radio silence uh, for the final transit, yeah. and 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 we never heard from them again. Okay. So, yeah, that's sort. Of, yeah, both of those were sort of tragic. Um, now the next program is called Silent War. Now these are this one would be uh, was really fascinating because I saw that one too, but. For people that like the Tom Clancy novels, um, or if you've read the book *Blind Man's Bluff*, so this one's called *Silent War*. What is this one's about? Well, a lot of the stuff in the '70s and '80s, like clandestine operations, or whatever. Yeah, the, uh, the I, I focused primarily on the uh, on the uh, USS Halibut, the USS Seawolf, and the USS Parchy. Uh, and uh, during the uh, 1970s and 1980s, uh, those three boats uh, actually provided the bulk of our uh, 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 naval espionage okay. uh, capability. And uh, uh, it, uh, it takes that you on, on several of the voyages that those uh, boats uh, undertook. Uh, and um, and what the political uh, yeah. climate was during yeah. those periods and, and why they were doing what they were okay. doing. Uh, and uh, it is kind of interesting to correlate what was happening in the political arena with what yeah. the, what the ships were, yeah. were, were no, doing. No, that was a very, very yeah. interesting one. Um, yeah. Now, the next one I already alluded to, you do a, um, you do, you have a program about the Soviet sub that I guess exploded, and then um, yeah, uh, the Americans is, were trying to. I guess what, how, tell us. This about is that probably one. the most bizarre uh, talk here because. It, it really, uh, in 1968, there was a, a missile, a Soviet ballistic missile submarine sank uh, to, the, to, the, to the bottom of the Pacific, northwest of, of Hawaii. And uh, uh, this one brings together uh, all of the top military personnel, uh, the CIA, and even Howard Hughes. No, I remember that. <laughs> uh, Howard Hughes and his companies, who were used as a, uh, as a front for this, uh, for this operation, to go and try to recover uh, okay. that. Uh, that submarine, and uh, it's the story uh, that I've titled, by the way, Project uh, Jennifer. Although within the last two years, the CIA has finally officially acknowledged that such a project did exist, but it wasn't called Jennifer; it was called the um, uh, uh, Azorian okay. Project Azorian. Uh, and so that's an interesting talk. It uh, the USS Halibut, the nuclear submarine, was used to find uh, that wreckage, and uh, and some very interesting ships were. Custom built yeah. uh, to go in and but I, cover it. I have to say because I remember seeing that one also. You you do sort of bring the human element in all the stories of the Russian guys and some of the things. They yeah, I mean uh, some of the mess. It was really very. I was sad, actually right? uh, surprised at uh, being able to find as much information yeah. as I did on the uh, on the uh, especially the officer crew yeah. of that of that Russian submarine, right down to family photographs and and uh, yeah, and where they went on vacation. <laughs> like I say, you do you do put sort of the, the human element of yes. all these guys in yes. this. Now the next one is um, the Arctic Submarine Lab. Yes. And I think the picture on the screen is very, people will be seeing with the polar bears. What's now, what's this one all about? Well, that's, this is a that's good. That's one I haven't seen. <laughs> no, actually we did do it here, oh, did it? Uh, Joe. Oh, we, yes, and, and, okay. uh, and cause I'll, I'll tell you one of the, that was one of the things where we had an interesting conversation with a, with a, uh, person in the audience, but this is a good example of, of where I really concentrated on a, uh, on a little known uh, uh, laboratory that still exists, the Arctic Submarine Laboratory, which really pioneered all of the, of the gear. Uh, the, nav the navigation sonar gear that's used to help submarines uh, navigate under the ice. Okay. And uh, they, they have been the coordinating body for all Arctic operations. Uh, and uh, no one has ever heard of You mean of whether that. underwater or on surface? Uh, no, on, uh, for submarine operations okay. in the Arctic. And uh, uh, 
uh, and, and it was really the driving force of a single individual that got that uh, laboratory established. And I use his career uh, up until he, he passed away in the 1980s and then where they've done uh, uh, things uh, even now because the, uh, the, uh, the boats uh, today, uh, you know, we still do civilian cruises, research cruises to the Arctic, uh, especially a lot of climate change studies. Uh, on, on, on the Navy nuclear yes, subs? The yes. Civilians go, okay. Yeah. And so that's what this, this is okay. about. It's about uh, uh, the Arctic sub lab, uh, how, we, how we got to being able to operate uh, under the ice in the Arctic, and then what kind of missions did we go on, including the ones okay. that are the scientific ones. All right, around. so yeah. when you were here doing that one, what was... What was the uh, <laughs> well? One of the things I one of the things I talk about in the early part of that is is that the, as a as a precursor to bringing those the boats in there, we did a lot of work on icebreakers to chart yeah. depths, and uh, actually there was a um, uh, there was a uh, a uh, oceanographer. Uh, 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 a woman, actually, op oceanographer that was in the audience that had been on the icebreaker oh, really? that, and on one of the trips that I was uh, talking about. So that's, oh, that's, oh, that's, wait, how did uh, that happen? I, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Why? But yeah, it is that you, I think you did, inevitably someone is always in the audience. Yes. Um, and then one of your newest ones, which you were here last year talking about, you have a whole program on the person who started the American nuclear sub-program is Admiral Hyman Rickover. That's and right. Sort of a tribute to him and his work and everything. Well, I thought of I thought uh, that after finally doing eight talks yeah. on nuclear <laughs> submarines, we ought to we ought to talk a little bit about how the program was generated that that did the initial design and, and actually still runs the uh, the operation of the of the of the boats and and uh, Admiral Hyman Rickover was uh, was the key catalyst in in, in that mm -hmm. going way back to the. Uh, to the uh, to the 19 uh, early uh, late 1940s and early 1950s, uh, uh, and so that story follows his life from actually his his birth. He was an immigrant, mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, up to up to his death. And what what are the uh, things that that he did? It, most people who would think of him uh, would be as the father of the nuclear navy, oh, yeah. but as an engineer. I think of him as as the man who took a wartime science in in, uh, in in atomic energy and made it into a usable power source. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the first person to do that, and not only. Uh, was that uh, viable for the nuclear submarine fleet, but that program, his program, actually designed and built the very first uh, commercial nuclear power station in this in this oh, okay, that's right. okay, at Shipping that, Port yeah. in Pennsylvania. So uh, he um, he uh, was an eminent uh, engineer, but most most well versed at maneuvering the political structure to, uh, know, to that, support that, that, um, <laughs> that one of all your programs did have more politics, I guess. And I think several people in the audience that night had little stories about Rick Over. Yes, that well, must be the <laughs> everybody has, if you, if you have had any interface with him, you always have a story about <laughs> <That's> Rick <what> Over. <laughs> now, your, your latest program, which you'll be here on Thursday night, February 28th, here in the library, 7 o'clock, and I this may be one of the first or second times you do it. It's, you're, you're naming it NR1, which you can say what is in a minute, but it's called America's Inner Space Shuttle. So what, what, what can you tell us about this one? Give us a little sneak preview, I guess you could. Yeah, the, you know, the, uh, this, this is an interesting story in, in a couple of respects. Number one is, is, is that the NR1 was the only, uh, uh, the world's only uh, nuclear-powered deep submergence uh, ocean engineering and, and research uh, a, a submarine. Uh, she was again built uh, through the uh, through the naval reactors program, but she was so secret that the uh, that boat was never commissioned as an official okay. navy ship just to keep it off the books, and uh, and uh, she had no name, so okay, it, was like called, NR1, it was yeah. called it was called NR one because that stood for naval reactors, the name of the program yeah. and the first boat in that in that. And coast. I think what it only. It could only it was only large enough for seven people. Or was uh, the, the the normal crew size was uh, you know somewhere in the uh, in the seven to eleven. All right, so uh, it was a very small, uh, a very small uh, okay. uh, ship uh, boat because it, it dove very deep. And, and then and, and uh, it uh, it uh, it had two roles. It did some it did some black operations uh, mm -hmm. in terms of espionage, but it also was available to the civilian uh, uh, scientists in the uh, in the United States. And in fact, the, the last half of its life was primarily spent on taking people 
uh, from the civilian world anywhere they wanted to go to take a, a look. I mean, they would fund that. You know, yeah. that's one of the ways. Like kept re researchers the or something. Research, yeah. And, so you, um, your your talk will be covering sort of both aspects. Both aspects. So how how did it get built, uh, and uh, what was its early career, which was primarily uh, Navy work, and then I picked. Um, I picked several of the uh, of the uh, of the missions uh, uh, in the scientific region uh, 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 area, uh, the ones that I could get the most uh, yeah. photographic uh, information on, uh, and uh, and so that is an interesting uh, talk. And uh, I hope some of the people that uh, worked at the laboratory. Uh, uh, and who had a hand in designing uh, that boat show up so I can give them make you mean them over in. over at Knowles. Yeah, over at Knowles. Okay, so I you hope got, they you show got up. I really want to I want to really wanted the opportunity to tr yeah. introduce those folks to the audience and Get him a so little did, round of applause. You know. So you worked on the NR1 yourself? I, I didn't. I didn't work on oh, NR, NR1, but I do know all of the. I was there when we did, oh, and, okay. and I know the people who, who worked oh, on okay. it. And, and uh, yeah, that was a kind of a small little side project. Yeah. In the, okay. In so the now, thing. other than having um, people come up to you at your presentations and saying, talking about some relationship they had, what are some of the what are some of the other responses that you get from all these various various talks that you think might want to you know mention before we. Well, I don't know. I think the uh, uh, I, uh, surprisingly enough, Joe, I, I I really have gotten nothing negative. I, I really expected uh, 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 folks to uh, who who may have had some uh, second thoughts about nuclear yeah. energy to be in that audience and ask me a bunch of questions that I didn't uh, probably wouldn't know how yeah. to answer. Uh, but that hasn't happened surprisingly yeah. enough, and maybe it's because I attract. Uh, an audience that uh, these talks only attract people who are interested in oh, yeah. in understanding how the boats were uh, uh, actually used. Um, the other thing, uh, the other the other feedback uh, I get, which is what I'm trying to do, is, is I never knew that that was going. And I, that's yeah. why I do the talks. I know you don't know, and I was trying to bring this to the to the public so they can understand uh, where their taxpayer money has uh, has gone and what it's been spent on here. So. Oh yeah. Well, I get to, like I say, I've seen so many of them and. You do. It is a tribute to the crews, and you do have a lot of information. On, yeah, uh, and, on and the uh, the uh, uh, I know the local uh, the local chapter of the uh, of the submarine uh, veterans association. Uh, there's a uh, there's a uh, uh, Albany Saratoga uh, okay. chapter of, of that, and uh, and uh, I, I've worked very closely with those guys okay. uh, and did some programs jointly with them. For example, at the military museum in Saratoga Springs. And now that group is what all retired. Yeah, they're all the retired submariners. Uh, submariners. Okay. Yes. Is that, a, is that the right word? Submariners. Yes, absolutely. Well, you're going to be here on Thursday night, February 28th, and if people are interested um, because this show will be on all during you know January, February. Why don't you give some times and dates of where you're going to be, and what maybe what the name of the talk, if people are interested, to be some of the ones. Yeah, I think uh, the other the other places I'll be in February is uh, I'm going to be at the uh, I do this uh, same uh, NR1 talk for the first time at the at the Clifton Park okay. uh, a Library on uh, on February 15th. Uh, that's a daytime program, and then I what also. What time is that going to be? That's at 10:30 okay. in the morning. We can mention the Clifton. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, I guess I got another one there. I, That's okay. On the February 20th, I'm going to be at the uh, Crandall Library in Glens Falls, and I'm going to do the Silent War talk uh, okay. there, the uh, espionage talk. Now, at, I just have uh, to tell people that was a that was a very interesting one. Yeah, it's a very interesting and one. What time on, is that's that? a Wednesday uh, at uh, at 6:30 in okay. the uh, in the evening, and then the uh, the last uh, week of the month there, the last day of the month in February, uh, we'll be here at Colony. Uh, for um, NR1, uh, NR1 okay. at, at uh, 7 o'clock. And I have several coming up in, in March. Uh, the uh, uh, Military Museum, the Boston uh, Library. I, I do talks for organizations. Uh, ASME, for example, is, is one. I do even private parties. Okay. Uh, by the way, I, I would like to tell the folks that uh, uh, I don't charge anything for doing this. Yes, this is a, this is a hobby, yeah. uh, and there's no fee. I don't take an honorarium from anybody. I'm not looking for money or even any. Uh, sometimes they give me a lunch if they happens to be at a <laughs> lunch, uh, but uh, I do it because I want to bring that word out to the yeah. uh, to the to the folks. And so, if you want me, I joke and probably give you some of my. Well, we can put on the screen if people want to contact you. It's um, W I C Z two zero zero four at yahoo.com will be on the screen. You can get on Ray's mailing list. Um, he can, he, I think he alerts people to when he's gonna be around and he'll be doing, like he just said, 
he has 10 different programs. If you want to see them all, I've seen now, I think, eight, seven or eight, and they're all very interesting. So thank you, Ray, for coming down. Okay, Joe, thanks for really me. Really appreciate it. We'll see you here on February 28th. And for the people watching, Ray will be here on the 28th. And if you want to email him, you can find out um, where he's going to be. He just mentioned some February and March dates of some of these other talks. So we will see you next time on Getting to Know You. Yeah.